All right. So I'm Sean Chittenden. I'm going to talk to you today about codified Postgres schema for both developers and for DBAs, both. Uh, it depends on, on who your kind of audience is. I'm going to be talking about a couple of tools, most obviously Postgres. Um, none of this work works on any other database, by the way. This is very Postgres specific, everything that I'm talking to you about. I'm using a tool called Terraform. Um, and you're going to need some form of version control, because if you're writing code, you need to version your code, right? So today's agenda, we're going to run through a bunch of things. Thank you for the early risers. At least it feels early to me from the West Coast, as I said. Um, so we're going to go through bootstrapping a database. We're going to boot uh, by hand. We're going to use Terraform to bootstrap a database. We're going to import a database into Terraform. We're going to iterate through schema design using Terraform. Uh, figure out what it is that Terraform is doing under the hood, or at least you know get a really high level look at what that looks like, and then um, avoid some of the pitfalls from automation uh, that can come from uh, Terraform in particular. So bootstrapping a database, we've done this probably a thousand times. Uh, easy, probably more, some of us, where you create a role, you create a database, and you've bootstrapped the database, and you have something up and running. And we're going to use this as kind of like our starting point for what it is uh, that we do with Terraform and or when we're doing handing some form of state management, because schema is state, over to a tool. So there's lots of different ways of, of doing this. And, and you know if you come at, come at Postgres from the command line, uh, using PSQL, you've probably dumped in these commands by hand. But at some point in time, you're like, hey, I'm really tired of entering this stuff by hand. So instead of entering it by hand, I'm going to go and script this. Hey, guess what? I've got a dash C flag, so I can pass this in, maybe using something that's going to start looking like a shell script. And hey, I've automated my database creation. It's, it's fantastic. And, and you feel nice and productive because you've got a create database script. And that's fine. Like This is what I did for like 15 years as well. Um, and like you're, you're really on top of the world at this point in time. And it works, except for it doesn't. Right? If you try and run the same thing over and over again, it can't, because shell scripts tend to not be idempotent. Right? You can't run the same state modification until you start adding some, some conditionals and logic into your database scripts. And this becomes really difficult in, unless you have some understanding of dependencies. Because normally what you would do inside of a shell script like this is you would say, hey, create database if not exist, or I'm going to go and like do a select first, and then I'm going to go and create it. But when your, the size of the number of database objects that you have, let's say tables and other things like this, starts to grow into the tens or hundreds or thousands, managing this actually becomes kind of a problem. So I really quickly went and, and dug up a couple things, and it was Amazing to see some of the comments on Hacker News and just kind of the, the, the bad understanding that exists in the world about database and database schema management. Um, so fine, you know, if you think it's easy, then here you go. This is what developers do or something. Um, and I'm not saying that in a pejorative way. Like this is something that I've seen in production. And either this or I've seen the Rails equivalent where somebody goes and takes their application thinking it's in dev mode or test mode, points it at a production IP. And they do a drop database, drop table, or whatever it is on the production instance. So yeah, unfortunately, more common than not. Uh, but you do think that you fixed it when you're running it in test, right? But you've basically like sidestepped the problem of actually having to build a state or, or view of the world so that you can then make improvements on it. So and like, one of the, my favorite comments when I was looking for this was somebody that said that you know, in the form of, in, in a thread talking about automation, he said, well, it's simple. You can just go choose, right? In automation, there's no like, immediate escape hatch every time there's a decision point to go and talk to a human. That's not automation. Right? I just I lost it. So, <laughs> so you know, if you go back, going back to kind of bootstrapping here, and you know, at this point in time, like you, you know, when we're going back to like the manual world um, where we start, you go in and you take like maybe you, you create the database and you bootstrap a database, and then you're going to lo go load your schema inside of it because you've you've taken your entire schema and you've loaded it into some SQL file, and you're just going to like you know take the input of let's say PG dump and, and run with it, right? But like at this point in time, you you kind of unfortunately or fortunately, right? This is effective, but you've fallen into the trap of continuing to use. SQL and shell script initialization effectively, right? Like, um, or you know, copy or, or some kind of like interpretive thing. So, Terraform. Um, we're going to talk about what it would look like to do this in Terraform because there's a bunch of benefits from that. So, 
before we get into, or be, but in order to like kind of talk about what that looks like, um, you need to understand a little bit about Terraform because it, it, there's a lot here that can go right and a lot that can go wrong, especially if you don't have a good understanding of some of this. So Terraform, it's an open source tool, it's, uh, MPL, the, uh, uh, written in Go, um, written by largely by HashiCorp. There's lots of community contributions. I'm now, for instance, working on the uh, Postgres provider, um, and, and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about in the, the gist of it today. So uh, Terraform has a handful of inputs. Uh, it has a bunch of different providers, so you can use Terraform. Uh, some people here are using it to talk to AWS, to some people to Triton, some people to Circonus, or other like miscellaneous providers, Datadog and others. Um, so you, you can figure up you know, providers, I'll get into that in a second. You pass it a bunch of variables, and you pass it a bunch of configuration information. And then Terraform takes that, you know, mixes it up, and then splats out, you know, a bunch of work or does a bunch of work for you. So there's a couple of, of you know, recommendations, and uh, I, I scrubbed my deck here to remove that, but uh, in practice, I use a make file to go and drive most of this. It's a really thin wrapper around Terraform commands, plan and apply are the primary two, because the arguments just get to be a little unwieldy. Um, and then when you're doing a bunch of Terraform work, um, you know, ship their default values that have explanation, especially for sensitive data. So, and we'll see some of that here. So, inputs, right? You've got providers. Those ship as .tf files. You have config files. Those ship as .tf files. Or you write them as .tf files. You can actually mix and match these two things together, but I tease them apart very deliberately because one of them is how do you connect to something, and then config is what it is that I actually want it to be. State file is an artifact. It's the output of a plan or import. Um, and those are very important because if you lose that state file, you're going to kind of go back to ground zero uh, and have to go into a bunch of imports. And you'll see that in a minute. And then variable inputs. So this is how you get kind of your passwords or other miscellaneous uh, external information that, that you can factor out of your config. Um, and, and that's how you inject that. And so you, you take all four of those kind of like components and you can start using Terraform. At this point in time, you know, the big two commands are probably plan and apply. There's a couple of other really useful ones, import, which is what we're going to use here in a second, and show. It'll tell you what the state of the world is. So Terraform takes this configuration information, builds a large dependency graph, and at some point in time, you're going to want to inspect it, Terraform show. There's also Terraform graph, and I, I should have actually had that on this slide. Um, I, I reference it later. So providers, right? So we've got these th four different buckets. We're going to go through these. Providers, they are an endpoint, right? So in the case of Postgres, a pro Postgres provider will be configured with the connection information, right? It's basically a, a provider you can conceptualize as a place where you stuff the DSN, right? It's just your endpoint. There's other API endpoints. So if you wanted to go and talk HTTP to a service, you provide an API URL with your tokens or your credentials there. That's also a different type of provider. Um, end of the day, provider, effectively, you can think of as a connection string. So what does it look like? Right, now getting into kind of some of the code here. So providers, uh, in this case, we've got a Triton provider and we've got a Postgres provider. The Postgres provider uh, has a host, port, the database that it's going to connect to, username, password, you know, SSL information. Postgres provider defaults to requiring SSL. Okay, if you are not in the cloud world, you probably are talking to Postgres over non-SSL. You will have to put SSL mode disable. Really important gotcha. That will hang you up. It will hang me up. It hangs me up. Every time I go and do that, you have to have the SSL mode. Uh, so get over that. <laughs> um, but uh, you've got this provider. Fantastic. Uh, you can have different types of providers, right? The important thing here is you have the provider name. So from a syntax perspective, you, know, you have this, re this, this configuration entity called a provider, and the provider name is there as a string. The attributes are provider name specific, right? So these provider or these attributes here, alias host post, those are specific to the Postgres type. These attribute values are specific to the Triton type. Okay, so you have the provider attribute names. So when I talk about a provider attribute, I'm talking about one of these guys. And when I talk about an attribute value, one of those guys. 
inside of variable attributes or values, you can do variable substitution. And this is a really important concept in Terraform because with this concept, we actually can begin to build a dependency graph. Terraform does this for us just by seeing that there are variables here. Okay. Inside of, inside of, of values, we can, have, um, we can have helper functions. Right? So in this particular case, file. Um, and one thing that really, like, I read this and, like, this doesn't read right. My brain pops and just, like, quirks to the side every single time I read that. And if you, like, if you read this, what do you, what's missing? Yeah, exactly. There's no escaping, right? Well, inside of the first back quote here, the, the, uh, it creates a new context. So you don't have to escape quotes inside, okay? Convenient on some level mind bending on the other because I'm really used to like, you know, as, as I recurse through my parsing, expecting to have to backslash and, and provide like some kind of escape. Anyway, that's totally valid in Terraform. So there's helper functions. In this case, we have file. This, what this does is it goes and takes the variable value there and it'll read the contents of that thing. There's, there's a bunch of different helper functions. I just wanted to pick on this particular one. And that's why I made the comment here, like don't use it. Um, but it, at the same time, it's just one that I had handy. Uh, file is one, there's a bunch of different functions there. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna enumerate them. Uh, they're in the context of Postgres, not terribly useful, but it's just no, good to know that they exist. And then this particular variable here, we're gonna come back to what this means here in a second. This came as the output from a different resource, a different provider someplace else in the dependency graph. Um, so variable interpolation, when you see var dot, so you can't just go like dollar foo, you have to kind of provide some kind of namespacing. So user inputted variables are prefixed with var dot. So in this case, uh, Triton key material, that is the name of the variable, but I pre it's prefixed in the var namespace. Uh, when you see other types of variables that don't pre aren't prefixed with var, most likely, then you're talking about a resource type, a resource name, and then some kind of parameter or out, out parameter. And this is gonna start to stitch together hopefully in just a second because we're going on to config files. So in config files, very similar syntax. So this you know, configuration entity here is a resource type. You have the resource type, which we, I just referenced. We're gonna get to and you can start to see some of where we're going with this, this, this uh, talk. Um, so we have the resource type, the resource name, and these are unique. These are scoped to the, to, they, these are uniquely named within the scope of the resource type. Okay. So you can have, in theory, a resource name called table one across columns and sequences because they're uniquely scoped. Um, there we go. So Terraform, when you're building modules, or building modules, building configuration, you're going to want to build and construct things in terms of layers. The reason I say that is because you kind of want, we're, and I'm going to come to this as one of the tips later on, you want to minimize the blast radius. You've got this, you know, big dependency graph that we're going to start to build up by, you know, configuring a series of um, a series of, of resources that are going to describe our schema. We're going to hand that over to Terraform. Terraform's going to go do something for that. Well, imagine at the top of that graph, I go and rename something up here, and let's say Terraform did something bad. You know, that entire dependency graph potentially could be in a, in a, in a precarious state. That's not the case, but um, I, I just wanted to use that. As, uh, imagine, let's say, if you're in Amazon and that's like a VPC, and you want to change something, some fundamental attribute about a VPC, then like the entire dependency graph's gone because like every object in that VPC is going to get recreated. So like you're, you're going to have a bad day. So in the case of Postgres, when you go to, when you connect as the super user, right, that's a different connection string. Therefore, it's a different provider than when you go to create schema inside of a database because you've got a second connection, potentially and most likely, preferably, with a different username that has scoped privileges that are downscoped to just operating inside of that particular database. Which means then that we have two different Terraform config projects, directories, whatever it is, that 
you're going to operate on. You have one to go create the database, and then you have another one that's going to go and populate it with database objects, tables, sequences, indexes, whatever else. So just know that internally, like, it's really tempting to want to have all of your objects in a single repository, in a single directory, a single something. You really don't want to do that. You can actually, but I'm going to tell you you can't. Right? There's, like, there's a, a, a cognitive constraint to wanting to do that, not a technical constraint. So treat things as layers. Right? In this case, you've got two different phases. Each layer represents a phase. You have your create the database phase and layer, and then you have your populate the database phase and layer. And in theory, there are two different separation of concerns, right? If you've got kind of like the DBA is, uh, if you've got database as a service, let's say inside of your organization, they're responsible for just providing you with the database. If you're a developer, you're responsible for populating that database that you were just handed with a bunch of database objects, potentially. Um, and that seems to be a common organizational pattern. I embrace that even though like it's maybe the same person wearing two different hats. Go ahead, question. Go. You potentially could. Let me come back. There, there, the, the fundamental driver, there's two, there's two technical reasons for why it's, it's inconvenient, why you do want to do that, um, is provider aliases are kind of an all or nothing. Um, and that's like if you want to have two different Postgres connection objects, let's say, you've got the same po pro Postgres provider uh, but and, and that you're using. like. Uh, you've got the same Postgres provider here. Right? But you're going to connect to it twice, which means that you have to go and give it an alias. In this case, you've, you've created an alias called postgres.pg1, which is how you're going to reference that particular provider in the future. The issue with that is, is every single object from there on out, all your tables and all of your everything else, now has to go and reference this particular provider as opposed to the default Postgres provider. And it becomes really, really tedious to have to specify that. And for better or worse, the error messages you get back when you miss one of these is really not friendly. Because um, it'll say something like, if this, it's actually this SSL mode. This is why I made the comment. If, if, you, if you add provider alias someplace, um, to, and you're trying to do work locally, and you miss it, the error message you're going to get back is unable to connect SSLs on, on, the, on the servers not supported. And you're going, what the deuce? Right? Like, this just makes no sense. Like, of course SSL is not provided. I've configured it. Yeah, it's downstream someplace else where you're going to figure out that you forgot the, the Postgres alias. And because you forgot the default, or before, because you forgot the provider alias, uh, or to go specify the provider that you aliased, sorry, the default value for the default Postgres is to use SSL. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to come to like, let, let's come back to that in just a second when I get to a little bit further on. So we've got this directory, and we've got a separate directory for creating the database, and we've got, a second, uh, we've got one directory for creating a database. We've got a second directory that we are using for populating the database. That's kind of like the state of the world. I'm, I'm telling you, do that as advice. We'll, uh, the better way is potentially using a composition route someplace, uh, but I'm not going to cover that in this talk. So. What does this look like in practice, right? So I've got a directory here. I'm going to go and jump into my super user. I just created a directory called super user. And I populate it with a bunch of Terraform files. Inside of there, I'm going to hit make plan. So what this really is doing is, is and I didn't comment it out with an, uh, or didn't hide it with an at sign in my make file. Um, so you can see the actual command that it's running. I just didn't want to type this over and over and over again. And when I'm doing development, I don't want to type these commands over and over again in their full extent. So I just type make plan. That's really easy and just rattles off. So use make files. Uh, so make plan, great. So the first thing it does is, it, and there's a little bit of, of boilerplate text that I, I, I clipped just for brevity. Um, so the first thing it does is it goes and, and creates this database. Okay, fine. And it's telling you what the values are. Okay, that, that's basically what I passed in. Some of these values are computed, which means that when it goes and creates the, the resource, goes and creates Postgres, I didn't specify a C type or an encoding, for instance. Okay, when I go and create the object, or create, the, in this case, the database object, and then I go and read that value back, I'm going to go and get the, the computed values back, and then I'm going to go and, and use that potentially downstream. Uh, so that's what computed means. And then I'm going to do a second thing here, where I'm going to go in and create a role. So I'm going to create 
you know, and populate a PG Conwell because they're going to be the owner of this database and all the objects that are contained within it. So Postgres, I hasn't, or sorry, Terraform, the Postgres provider for Terraform hasn't done any work. It's just told me it's planning on adding two objects. Right? At this point in time, I've got a diff. The state of the world before and the state of the world afterwards. The state of the world before was a blank database. Nothing was there. The state of the world after this is I'm going to create a database and I'm going to go and create a role. Maybe not necessarily in that order. It's up to Terraform to resolve that. Now, when I say, hey, listen, this plan, this looks right. The color coding, by the way, is, is not my emphasis. That's actually what it looks like coming out of Terraform. It's nice and very easy. If you're colorblind, I apologize. Um, so when you hit make apply because the plan looked good, then it'll go and do this. And it says, hey, goes and creates it, goes and creates it. Interesting. The first thing it did was it created the role. It didn't create the database first. In the plan over here, it listed the, that it was going to do the database first and then the role second. But in reality, when it goes to actually go and, and when it goes and walks the, the dependency rough, it said, hey, wait a second. In order for me to go and figure out and, and do the grants on the database, I actually need to have the role in existence first. Right? So, great. It does a depth first search uh, on the dependency graph, creates a role, creates a database, and it says, hey, my apply is done. I added two things. And I wrote out the state to dot terraform dot state. Go ahead. Yeah, so in, I actually don't know, that's a really good question. So the question for the recording or audience is, um, why, does, is, why are these two potentially out of sync? Why is, is the, uh, the, the order of valuation on the plan side of things different than the order of valuation at the apply side of things? Uh, I think it's because it actually hasn't done the, the, the uh, it hasn't walked the dependency graph, and it doesn't do that until it does apply, uh, the apply phase. Um, I think that's basically it. I, this order is stable. I think this is probably alpha sorted, actually. Yeah, I, I, I could probably confirm that uh, shortly after this, but I think internally it's probably doing an alpha sort, and it says PG database sorts before P Postgres role um, from a text perspective you know, when it's looking at the, at the, uh, the uh, object names here. Correct. I, I, yes. You'll understand when when this when the size of this gra dependency graph gets big enough, you're like, eh, punt. Like like trying to like s figure out the sequencing on my end. You at some point, if you're running across a, a cyclic dependency, you'll probably need to do some of that stuff. But for all intents and purposes, it's 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 right and just punt. Question. Go ahead. The plan is the dry run. I didn't want to make a bit, I'm sorry, I maybe, I should not have overemphasized the fact that like it's different. All I was trying to point out was that it will go and do a dependency graph walk. And so we're going to, I'm going to show that in just a second, sorry. Uh, the sequencing is not normally a problem. Um, so anyway, it does the plan. Uh, or we did the plan, we do the apply. The only thing I want to leave coming out of this is A, it, it, it tells you how much work it did, and it wrote out this information to the state file. If you lose that state file, you're going to have a bad day, right? Because then you're going to have to go back and recreate all of this by hand somewhere, again. And you're going to be doing a bunch of imports. So just know that that Terraform state file, even though it's a dot file, um, or I, you don't, I rename it as a dot file because I don't want to see it in most of my listings. But I, you very, very, very much need to back it up. Think of it and treat it like you would your PG data directory. It's important, right? It will save you a lot, a lot, a lot of grief and man hours and person hours if you lose that. Why, like, yeah, why can't it recreate it from the current state? It can. That's what import is. Hold on a second. We're going to come back to that. Uh, or up to a point, it can do that. Um, so make plan. Hey, great. So when I mentioned, made my, my snarky comment up front about using scripts, well, that's great and all, but like, Scripts don't let you rerun the same command over and over again. They're not idempotent, right? And that certainly became kind of buzzword compliant thing to say for a while. But like, it's kind of useful because I can just hit make plan, and it'll say nothing needs to be done, right? Now, on thousands of objects or tens of thousands, like, hey, this is really useful. 
I can maybe use this at some capacity. But like in the meantime, I make plan just tells me there's nothing that needs to be done. Okay, so using this is kind of like our provider. This is this was actually the provider that I used for the, the prior example. It's a piece of cake. And you can go look at what did under the hood, and you're like, hey, that's actually like that's exactly what I told it to go do. Now I'm going to go and do a drop database. Okay, and I'm going to go and make plan again. That should be make plan up there. Um, and it's going to tell me, hey, I have one resource that I need to go and add. Because when Postgres goes to, or when, when Terraform goes to go read the state of the, of the database, it says, hey, this database just doesn't exist. But the role already does exist. Right? So then it's going to go and create it for you. Now, this is why I said don't lose your state file. <laughs> because if you would have gone to, to, if you would have blown away your state file and hit a make plan and then make apply, it would have said, hey, I have two things that I need to go and create, the role and the database, because I have nothing in my state file. So, you know, this was fine, but like, I went and had to go and create the database as a super user, which I didn't want to have to do, right? Maybe I've, I, in my organization, I've got tight controls, and I actually want to delegate the authority of creating databases, so I don't want to ha give Terraform my super user credentials. It's just a totally reasonable thing to do, in my opinion. So we can do better than that. So let's go and do, Let's create a Terraform DBA account because I don't want to give Terraform like the keys to the kingdom, all the keys to the kingdom at least, right? And I want to go in and push this down. So I, I don't need to drop the database. I'm, I'm using this basically to make a point. Um, but again, I'm drop the database. Here's my provider. But now I change my username to be TFDBA, not Postgres. I'm going to do a make plan apply. Don't do that. Don't do that. Always go and read things. So don't don't do as I say, not as I do. Um, and uh, yeah, make plan, step one, that is this bit here, you know, truncated for brevity, make apply, and it says, hey, I went and added it, and it moved on. But it created the database as the TFDBA user, right? Because I delegated the create role, create DB. And it does, under the hood, all the appropriate grants and revokes in order to temporarily go in and, you know, create this object. There's some quirks in Postgres's permission model that Terraform totally glosses over. And we can see that right here, right? Grant to DF TFDBA. So it grants PGCon role to TFDBA, and then it revokes it at the end of the create. You can't do this otherwise. It's kind of a, an anomaly. Uh, I don't know. It, it irritates me. But it does this all for you, right? There's, there's no garbage left up behind. So this is good, right? There's, you know, there's no, the, the plan has converged. So, ah. So drift detection, right? So like, if I keep running this idempotent operation over and over and over again, I keep saying make plan, make plan, make plan, and then one time it goes from OK to, hey, maybe it's not OK, right? I, you, I just used Terraform to go catch that some schmuck was running around and did an alter database, change the owner, let's say, right? I mean, there's lots of different pathologies here that you potentially have. But like, it told me that there was, a, there was drift, right? A, go figure out what happened, right? But B, I can go fix it make apply, right? And I'm going to go and drive convergence because the sanctioned source of truth for what the database should look like is Terraform at this point in time. Okay, does that make sense? So at this point in time, I've got this really tiny project. I've got a handful of you know, metadata files that are specific to, post, uh, to Terraform. I have a make file that I just keep sim linking around to, in order to do the make plan, make apply. Uh, and I can, you know, connect, create, using, instead of me pasting passwords in plain text, I've actually got those in my Terraform vars file, which is a copy of my Terraform vars example um, with values subbed in. So this is nice and commented up. Um, and I, sh I ship that in the, in the public repo that that's accompanies this talk. So uh, I've got my, my make file. I've got my connection. So I'm, I'm changing directories here now, uh, or will in just a second, eh, maybe. Uh, OK, so I'm able to do hit passwords. Um, yeah, I forget what my exact point on this slide was, sorry. Um, OK, so if I already have a database, right? going back to the point, like, can it just import and refresh the state from the existing state of things? Kind of can. Uh, we're going to use Terraform import to go do that. So let's say I've got all my config already written. Right? This simplifies the example. This isn't quite exactly what you would normally do in practice. But let's say I, I do something terrible, like I blow away my state file. Please don't do that. 
Um, I'm gonna hit, I, I've got a little target in there, make import, and it goes and imports, you know, the Postgres role pgcon using the key, lookup key, pgcon is the actual username that already exists in the database, and I can import it, and then I can do make show, and it tells me, hey, great, I've got, you know, I, I just loaded my state file with the existing state of the world. It's not a bad idea, potentially, to have, if you know that this is going to be a common issue occurrence, uh, Terraform is not, uh, it's, it wouldn't be a bad idea to go in and throw some of these kind of like targets so that you can programmatically regenerate your state um, if you needed to, but you really shouldn't ever have to do that, to be honest. Um, I'm just saying you could. Uh, Terraform doesn't do a walk of the entire thing. Go ahead. Correct. What was it? Oh yeah. So it, uh, the question was um, earlier. I didn't have to regenerate when I, in the alter when it detected the drift. I didn't have to go and regenerate anything because Terraform was able, was able to know. The reason Terraform was able to know was because it had all that information already loaded in its state file. The reason it detected that change was because it actually talked to Postgres and said, "Hey, the database owner changed." And then it told me and reported that out because there was a change in the configuration and the state file with what was actually in reality. Um, and I need to pick it up. Otherwise, can we talk more about that later? Uh, we're going to get way deep into the internals of, Postgre of, of Terraform. Um, and there's some interesting kind of like policy decisions there that I don't want to litigate this second. Um, but I'm, so I'm not blowing you off. All right. So we did the role because I blew away the state file. I, you know, everything was gone. So both the role and the database are gone. So I'm going to go and import the role. And now I'm going to import database. And at this point in time, I've got both things there, right? And you can see in the make show, and I'm positive at this point in time, it's, it's, it's doing a lexical sort on the object names here. Um, is when I do a make show, I can see that I've got both the database and I've got the role. Great. So now I can make plan, and it tells me that, oh, at this point in time, if I did a make plan, it would tell me that there's nothing that's, that, that's changed because I've got everything in the database or in the state file. Right? There's no difference between my configuration file and Postgres, uh, no difference between my configuration file and my state and what's in Postgres. They are, they have converged, they are the same, right? They're in sync. Now that I've imported both of these two resources. This was only for two resources at this point in time. Imagine this on tens, uh, the largest one I've seen has over 10,000 objects in it. It's big. You don't ever want to have to go back and, and piece this stuff together by hand. So please hold on to your state file. So now that I've, I've created a database as the super user, I'm going to go on to actually creating objects inside of it. Uh, as, as a developer or you know, somebody that, that's curating a particular set of database objects. So I've got a second set of roles now because I'm going to connect as the pgcon user, right? not as the super user, not as the Terraform DBA user, as the pgcon user because the pgcon user is the owner of my database called pgcon. Not very inventive. So I'm going to Terraform plan. It's going to refresh. And... There we go. It's going to tell me that it needed to do two things. Uh, I forget what the second one is. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, it, it's going to go in and splat this out. Um, and I'm going to start moving and I'm working exclusively inside of, of the pgcon uh, directory at this point in time. So variables, pop stack, going back like almost 20 minutes now, it feels like. Um, Variables, if I need to go and pass in values, I can do this in one of two ways. And I can pass in configuration values by passing in the dash var flag in, on the command line. Uh, it's kind of clunky, uh, but doable. You probably want to be using a vars file if and when you need to use it. So you have like some external file that represents all of your you know, configuration for this particular thing. And if you're missing input, it'll actually block. Terraform will block and, and you know, pop a human exception you know, back to meet space and say, hey, I need you to give this because like, there is no default value and I need input for this value in order to make forward progress. And there you go. And there's two different types of kind of variables, like I mentioned earlier, which is like you can have user specified variables and you can have variables that come out of the, or that are the output of some other resource. So in this case, this is using a Triton machine and it's grabbing the IP address. So the, th the host here is actually something that I did, uh, is, is dependent on a, something I did earlier, which is to go spin up a machine using a Postgres resource, or using a Terraform resource called Triton Machine that I named Postgres 9.6. And out of that, as soon as that 
that resource was created by Triton, it will assign it a primary IP address, and then I can reference that primary address inside of my Postgres provider someplace else in the dependency graph. Right. Now, implicitly, that means that the creation of a database server right, is an upstream dependency of the provider that's going to go in and put the configuration into the, uh, into the database on the host that I just went and spun up. So convention now. So inside of a directory, if you want to specify the, the variables, right, either your output variables, your input variables, or whatever it is, use interface.tf. It's not a requirement, but it is a, you know, a convention within the Terraform community. And you've got kind of three things that you stash in, in interface. The first one is, is you're going to have variables. So what a variable block look like, right? You've got your type. It's either string, uh, but it can also be map list or list. A default value, optional. A description, also optional. But this is useful because like, now I've got self-documenting code in theory. Okay, so you put a bunch of these kind of variable declarations effectively in interface.tf. Terraform is very explicit and it's in its syntax and its expectations of you. Modules, which is a way of saying, you know, hey, I have some dependency on another chunk of code, right? So if I wanted to go and spin up my machines in a different module, right, go and provision and acquire uh, like a bunch of, of VMs, I would do that potentially in a different module. Okay? And I need to do that before I can go and load schema because I can't load schema in anything until I have my servers spun up. So that's what a module would be for. Or it would be the common use of a module. Um, potentially managed by different teams, but I'm not going to cover that. Um, output. Uh, these are out parameters. So effectively, if somebody else, like the, 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 when I was mentioning the VMs earlier, though that, that module would have an output parameter that I would then be able to reference. Right? It's basically like you know, named return values from a function. That's, that's a good way of thinking about it. So input variables are you know, the arguments passed to a function. Output variables are named return values from a function. And module is effectively a function. So if you wanted to see what this kind of looks like, great, variables, I've got a module, and I've got a bunch of outputs. And uh, da -da -da, yeah, um, variable file. Commented up. This is a dot example version ish. So this is what I would kind of like normally do, and I'd have all my default values kind of commented out, so I could know. Hey, listen, I just need to go and run this command, copy and paste, run this command, you know, splat stuff in. I just want to you know blow and go, and leave this so that the next person who comes and looks at this can actually understand what it is that needs to go there. Kind of the, one of the most frustrating things that you can do is is have a default value with no understanding of what value you're supposed to plug in there. Um, I don't know. This is just a gripe from firefighting day. Um, so what looks like in the dependency graph? So the, this particular role right, creates an implicit dependency. I'm sorry, this variable here creates a dependency on this role existing. Okay. So as a result, the evaluation order of this is, is goes and does the, the role followed by the database depth first search. Okay. It does that automatically. Um, purely based off of variable names in the, in the interpolation. There is a way of explicitly doing that. I'm not covering that, but I just know that it's there. So your state file, so that's how dependencies are created. Um, and we're going to get to schema here in just a second, um, but I am running low on time. Um, so state file, um, it's what is a, a snapshot of the world. It's a big ball of JSON. Don't lose it. You can look at it. And it's local to your process. So if you're having to twiddle this by hand, you're having an interesting day. Uh, it's not, it, you shouldn't have to do that. I maybe do it like once a month, maybe. Uh, if I'm doing development, maybe a little bit less than once a month. If I'm doing steady state things, like never. But if I'm doing development, I break things along the way because I'm writing the Postgres uh, provider, then, um, you know, yeah, a little bit more often. But anyway, just know that it's a bunch of JSON. You can go and look at it and edit it. It's really kind of a useful way of looking at like the, 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 the nitty gritty of, of some random API provider, too. So we've imported a database. Um, what does it look like? Well, normally what you would do actually is you would say import the database into your state file, and then you would write config until make plan says no changes. Right? What I did earlier when I did the drop database was the exact opposite, and I did that just for, for brevity for talking about it and introducing the concept. But in, in practice, what you're actually going to do is you're going to invert that, where you're going to import first, write config, do a make plan, or keep and, and iterate on that, those last two steps until the plan finally converges and you have no drift. Okay. Now, note, 
on import, if you get the lookup names wrong, or you grab the wrong object, or you name the config wrong, your config will not converge, or your plan will not converge. That's most likely a bug in one of these two things, right? And it sometimes can be very frustrating to figure that out. So save yourself some time, measure twice, cut once, and uh, get the right values there. All right, so um, right, this is exactly, uh, so in, this is why it worked earlier easily, and the plan immediately converges because this provider, or not the provider, uh, there we go. That was the provider, this is the import. Um, so it would do the import and plan, and you keep running these cycles until the Terraform plan comes back with zero, zero drift. But yeah, <laughs> if you try and import something that already exists in your state file, it'll yell at you. So because we're, we're approaching this as like, as, as DBA is where you've already got typically some kind of state, the imp understanding the mechanics of import is particularly important so that you can begin to, you know, begin managing and, and uh, databases using Terraform without having to like take your existing database to a ground state. Uh, so users, uh, yeah, so in this case, I've got a role, sim same thing, import and it all works. Graph theory. So this is what it's doing. So it was doing a de depth first search. You don't need to know what most of these, like a lot of these are like internal objects, but you can see like users provided bits where the database depended on the role. Right. This is the dependency graph. Internally, post, uh, Terraform goes and walks this, and it goes and resolves the things at the bottom first before it starts to pop layers and then evaluate the next set of things until it eventually gets back to the root. Okay. So with that foundation under, uh, underway, or understood, now we can get into like how do you actually use this on a database basis, potentially, in order to build some schema. So. Postgres roles, right? You specify a name, login, attribute. There's a, I, I, I went back, there was originally a, a Terraform a Postgres provider and it was bare bones, right? And I'm glad somebody did it, whoever did it, I should know their name. Um, but I went back when I was going to, and, and revisiting this and I tried to make everything that at this point in time feature complete so that all of the attributes and everything that you would see and expect from a create role or alter role is actually supported, right? And so I'm doing, taking this very bottom-up approach to the, to the Postgres provider, and I, I'm not done with, with like, there's not 100% coverage of Postgres by any stretch. I was hoping I'd be a little bit further along before this talk today. Um, but it, it, it's not 100% coverage. But you'll see that, like, as I'm going through, I'm going out of my way to go and hit all the values um, so that it can be used as a first-class citizen. And you'll, uh, when, I, when I show you my motivation here in just a second, you'll be like, I get it now. So then you can have a schema here. So in this case, I've got a Postgres schema. So I'm going to create foo service as a schema. And its owner is some other role here. I have a policy. I can specify DCL on this. Right? Internally, it's parsing the privileges. It's doing, it's got a really primitive kind of like set of unions here that it's, it's doing in order to like, you know, basically create a solution set so that you can actually modify a policy and it'll do the right thing here. You can actually say, uh, you can have roles with duplicate permissions, and then it'll actually come back and negate the privileges for you. If you said, you know, create false on some other policy down below. Um, because I really did want to have, like, the ability to manage complex permissions and complex schema um, using this. So that was part of it. So sequences, right? Hey, this is, the sequences are really easy. Um, I'm actually probably going to get this one out the door by noon today. Uh, testing, maybe not, but real close. Uh, tables. Tables are a little, are goofy, though. So tables, we have a create table, but you don't have a create column concept right, in Postgres. So what we do instead is inside of Terraform, I basically lie to you. And I tell you, hey, you have to create this column object first, and then I'm going to reference that column object when I go to create the table later. So internally, it creates the dependency graph in a way that allows Terraform to walk all these objects. So if I go and change the name here, in the column up here, it'll do the right alter table for you. Right, alter table, uh, alter table, alter column, uh, rename to whatever. Yeah, um, and then yeah, I can reference these objects, and I can begin building kind of more complex structure. So there are more comments that just drove me insane. Um, uh, this just, yeah, the NoSQL movement, man. Um, 
So what is Terraform actually doing under the hood? And I've got just a few seconds, so I'm going to run through this super fast. Plan, it runs through the cycle. Look at the slides. You can see what it's doing. These blue parts are what the Postgres provider do is doing. The white parts are what you as the user do. Please pause to go before you do your apply. And the white stuff is all what Terraform is doing under the hood for you. It's doing all this work to go in and create this dependency and push data in and out of the state file as necessary um, so that at the end of the day, you have like a converged state with all the dependency graphs and dependencies satisfied based off of whatever it is that you, you threw, threw into the input. So, and the reason I did this was because before, after, right? See the difference here, not null and null, okay? I wanted to be able to go and have a way of having a tool go and do the least disruptive path automatically for me or for whoever so that I could actually go through and have the alter table add column not null with default be a non-disruptive operation because I'm sick and tired of shitty ORMs doing like just naive statements. And Terraform provides the hooks for this. It's got what are called partial states, and so I can go and incrementally do this, like alter table add column with null, alter table alter, add column with null default, go and backfill records if I need to, and then go and make the, the appropriate changes in the system catalogs once I know that I've got 100% convergence. And computers are really good at this laborious thing. We people get irritated by it, and so we pay database consultants a lot of money. Um, it was great, I liked it. Um, but uh, yeah, before and after, right? Like this is a disruptive thing if you do this in a naive way because like this is going to grab an exclusive lock. So I'm gonna skip the Terraform bet, uh, tips here. They're in the slides. Um, there's a lot to it. We can, and if you catch me throughout the rest of the conference, happy to talk about it. Um, where are we? These I was hoping I would have done before I talk today. I'm really close. They're probably gonna be done before the end of the conference. Um, the backlog, there's a lot to do. Indexes in particular are something that's a little tricky. Um, and how do you go and do DCL on some of this stuff? Uh, selects, views, PL, those are simple. Uh, settings, I wanted to get, like there was just a sequencing issue there. S table spaces, very simple. DML, I want to be able to do insert, update, delete. Um, foreign data wrapper and table partitioning. This is, this for me is what I really want to get to. I want to be able to take an existing database and go and add the partitioning, you know, decoration attributes to an existing Terraform config and have it do all the alter tables for me and all of the, the, the munging and moving of data around under the hood. So, Parting thoughts, the only thing that is absolutely mandatory as you adopt this tool is with great power comes great responsibility. Don't let Terraform become Terraform and uh, only you can prevent forest fire. Please stop, pause, and think as mentioned here, right? Don't random sort that list. Oops, and thank you. Two minutes over. I'm good with that.